All right, so now let's begin with the sixth question of this paper. It says that a block B of mass two kgs lying on a rough inclined plane sloping at 30 degrees to horizontal. A light rope inclined at an angle of 20 degrees above the line of the greatest slope. This is the line of the greatest slope. So above that, there are above that 20 degrees lies are this particular rope. And the tension in that rope is given to us as T newtons. So now there is also a friction force because it's a rough inclined plane. We are having a friction surface. If it was a smooth inclined plane, we would not have friction surface. All right. So anyway, now there is a friction that is acting in the opposite direction. Obviously, if you are trying to pull it upwards, this block is going to move in the upward direction. So to resist this forward force, there is a backward force called friction force acting on that body B. And the coefficient of the friction between this block and that surface is given to us as a mu. We also know that the friction formula, the friction formula is given as the coefficient of friction, that is mu, times the normal. Normal is nothing but the force which is acting normal to the surface on which block B is placed. So now, if this is the surface, if this is the block, normal to that acts over here. So over here, we are having a normal force. Along with that, we also know that this mass is of uh, 2 kgs. So there will be a force of weight acting on that body. And weight is always vertically downwards. So if I'm drawing that, this is my 2g. And g stands for 10. So 2 into 10 is 20 newtons. So this is not newtons, OK? This is the normal force. If you want, you can also switch this to r to avoid confusion. R also stands for reaction force. So reaction force, contact force, normal force all represent the same thing. All right. I like to recall it as a normal force because it helps me understand that it's a force that is perpendicular to the surface on which our body is placed. But anyway, I'm just replacing that with R to avoid the confusion. So it's R newtons over here and 20 newtons over here. Now, so there are two ways through which you can solve this question. OK, I know that we have not read the first part. But I know that this kind of questions are there in all the papers. So we have to resolve these forces. So you can resolve the forces maybe in the x and y direction. OK. You, you resolve this r in y, this t in y and x. Or else you can also resolve this perpendicular to this, this slope and parallel to the slope. I like to solve this kind of questions perpendicular and parallel to the slope. So if you are someone who has not adopted this kind of method, I would personally recommend you to stick to this method because it's pretty much simple. Any kind of questions that are given with respect to slope, you will be able to solve it very quickly. Because see, now you are already having a practice of how you can solve the uh, forces in the x and y direction. There is no much amount of practice for this kind of inclined slope so that you can resolve it in the parallel or the perpendicular direction of it. Right. So make sure that you are uh, having this kind of knowledge as well. And that's the reason why I always like to solve this kind of questions Assuming that I will be resolving all the forces perpendicular to the slope. That's the line of action that I'm drawing over here. This is perpendicular to the slope. And this is parallel to the slope. All right. So now with this being said, uh, the first part of the question is asking us to find out the value of this tension if the value of force is equal to the value of the friction actually is equal to 5 newtons. And the acceleration is obviously up the slope and it's of 1.2 meter per second square. So what's the value of this tension? So for that, we need to resolve the forces in the parallel and perpendicular to the slope. So if I resolve, what I'll do is I'll just take this as a reference diagram and mark all the forces somewhere on the right side over here. I'll also draw some extra space for us so that it's easier to draw. So now, Let's say that this object B is represented by this point. And now, if I'm resolving the T force in the direction of the uh, angle, okay, so that's where I have to mark this T, right? So it's going to be acting over here. So this will be cos component of 20. Why? Because 20 is coming in between. So this is T cos 20. And similarly, if I resolve it upwards, it will become T sine 20 because now we are going away from that marked angle. So this will over here, it will be the reaction force is there, no doubt. But along with that, there is also T sine 20. 
Now we are done with the T force and R force. On the backward side that is parallel to the slope, on the backward side there is a force of friction. There are There is one more force that will come because of the weight. I will talk about that. Let me just write friction value over here as F. And uh, now, what about this 20 Newtons? How will I rotate it in the direction parallel and perpendicular to the slope? For that, I either need this angle or I need this angle. So if you are someone who is uh, addicted to this way of solving, you must have quickly identified that this is equal to the same angle. What's the logic behind that? See, this is a 90 degree triangle that is formed. So this is 90, this is 30. So 90 plus 30 is 120. So from 180, because we know that the total angles in the triangle is 180. So if you do 180 minus 120, you are left with 60 degrees. So this is your 60 degrees. So now this is also your 90 degrees that is getting formed over here. So from that 90, if I'm removing 60, I'll be left with 30. So you don't need to derive this kind of things again and again. It's just that when, once you're having practice, you will get an idea that, okay, yeah, this 30 is also coming over here, all right? So now if I'm trying to resolve these forces, the values that I'll be getting for perpendicular to the slope will be 20 because 30 is coming in between. It will become 20 cos 30 over here. So over here, it's 20 cos 30 because of the weight. And if I resolve it over there, if I'm going away from this 30, it will become plus 20 sine 30. Now make sure that if you're, let's say if you're marking this as 60, then this will become 20 sine 60. This will become 20 cos 60. All right, but anyway, it's completely up to you how you want to solve this. I particularly like to choose the same angle that is given so that it does not require me to do any kind of extra calculations. But anyways, these are all the kind of forces. I'll just cross check it. T has been resolved in this perpendicular and the parallel to the slope. R is marked. The force is there of friction. This weight is also sorted in the perpendicular and the parallel direction of the slope. So we are all set to now find out the value of T. So we know that because it's in motion, we have to implement F net equals to MA over here. So what's the net force acting on this body B? They can clearly see that it's moving upwards, right? It's given in the question. So it's clear that it's moving upwards. So the upward force will be positive. Downward force will be negative. So therefore, T cos 20 is having a positive values. And all the other values on the other side will be minus. So minus 20 sine 30 minus friction force, which is given to us as 5, is equals to mass, that is 2, times acceleration. So what's the value of acceleration? 1.2. That's it. Now if you just go ahead and solve this equation in your Kelsey, you'll be getting the value of T as, so here is my Kelsey. I shift everything first of all to the uh, right hand side and divide both the sides by cos 20 to get the value of t. So see, I don't write all the kind of calculation steps on paper because it's not required. You can solve this manually in your brain. And yeah, that's it. So 2 times 1.2, then I add 5 to it, then 20 sine 30 on top of it. So 17.4 is equal to t cos 20. So now you can divide 17.4 with t, uh, I mean cos 20. So now 17.4 divided by cos 20 comes out to be 18.5 correct to three significant figures. So now my T is 18.5 Newtons. This is correct to three as well. I hope that you are able to understand each and every aspect of it. The whole reason of solving these questions in front of you step by step about how you should think about a question is helping you in your examination practice. Just in order to solve more of this kind of questions, feel free to inquire us about this on this WhatsApp number and we'll be happy to help you out and uh, take your journey one step ahead where we'll be solving all the kind of past papers together live. I'll be there, you will be there and yes, all the kind of other students including you with me will be solving a lot of uh, practice papers before the final examinations. But yes, that's, uh, that's it for the first part of this question. Uh, first part, of A part. There must be, I guess, one more part of part A. So if I go ahead and see the next part. Yes, they are now asking us to find out the value of mu. All right. So now I'll just 
mentioned uh, something over here that the value of t that we got is 18.5 all right newtons everything else i just get rid of it because we don't need it and we are asked to find out the value of mu so let's see what what can we do we don't even need the diagram because we are having everything drawn to the right side so that's the benefit of drawing an extra thing so that we don't need to scroll up up and down again and again all right so now to find out the value of mu we need to solve this in the perpendicular to the slope direction so if i'm solving it perpendicularly to the slope what am i going to get i'm going to get see first of all there is no kind of acceleration happening uh, perpendicular to the slope this block is not jumping up or down therefore it's in equilibrium in that direction itself so i can say that the upward force uh, of the plane and the downward force uh, of the plane that is perpendicular to the plane are equal to each other so i can say that r plus 18 point whatever was the value i'll just write 18.5166 it's the value of the tension that i got from my calci uh, times sine of 20 is equal to 20 cos 30. so from here i'll be getting the value of r as 20 cos 30 minus this t 18.5166 time sine 20 and now if i simply take the value of friction as 5 and divide that by r i'll be getting the value of mu therefore my mu is equals to the friction force that is of 5 divided by r so if you take this value substitute it over here the value that you will be getting will be 5 divided by 20 cos 30 minus 18.51669 sine 20 it comes out to be 0 0.455 0 0.455 there are no units of the coefficient of friction so this is the final answer correct to three significant figures now for the part b of question six the whole configuration has been changed the friction between this block and the slope has been changed to 0 0.8 and the value of the tension is now equal to 15. We have to determine whether the block B will move up the plane or it will not move up the plane. So for that, let's understand first of all the, the concept of friction over here in a proper way. So let's say that over here there is a horizontal surface on top of which there is a block. Now this is a rough plane and therefore there will be some kind of a friction acting over here. And let's say that the maximum friction that you can get is eight newtons all right so now let's say that there is some kind of a man standing on the left side of this block who is trying to apply a force of three newtons will the block move no the block will not move why because there is equal amount of force because of friction which is trying to stop it it will not be beyond it will not be eight newtons directly because if it's eight newtons it means that this block should move to the left that's not happening it's just that this maximum value of friction is telling you that the friction value cannot exceed the value of 8 newtons. It can be anything in between 0 to that maximum value, but it cannot exceed that value. And that value is determined by the coefficient of friction because the normal force is always going to be staying the same. It's just that because of this mu, we get an idea about what is the maximum friction that this box will experience. So let's say that if I'm implementing or if you are implementing the force of three newtons, this friction force will be adjusted to three newtons automatically because of which we are not able to move this thing. Now, let's say that you are implementing a force of five newtons. This will again implement the force of five newtons. It's still not moving. Now, what if you're implementing the force of eight newtons? So the maximum value of the friction is now achieved. Now, this is called limiting equilibrium where you know that you are, you are experiencing that the push that you are applying to the box is now on the verge of moving the box. That is what is called as limiting equilibrium. Limiting equilibrium, where you can sense that the force, if you provide any more force as compared to what you are giving right now, your object is going to move in a particular direction. In this case, towards the right. So just let's just say we are providing a force of 8.001 it will move a bit because this force is dominating then the maximum friction force. This friction force cannot go beyond eight newtons. 
therefore even if you're giving some kind of extra additional force on top of eight newtons this object is going to move and that's this is the kind of concept we are going to use in order to solve this whole question of part b let's see what what can we do over here with that concept now because we are trying to understand if the maximum value of the friction would be reached if let's say uh, limiting equilibrium is moving up the plane okay because if two two things can be happen happening when we are saying limiting equilibrium it could either move up the plane it could move down the plane because we know that uh, we are asked in the question whether this object b is going to move up the plane let's consider this limiting equilibrium uh, for b to move up the plane to move up the plane All right, so that's the limiting equilibrium condition that we are gathering. That's the reason why the force of friction will be on the opposite direction. Let's say that if you are considering that the limiting equilibrium is for B to move down the plane, in that case, this friction force would have come on the opposite direction because friction force is actually trying to oppose the motion. So this adjusts automatically depending on where is the object about to move. So now because you have considered it about to move up the plane, the friction force will be acting down the plane. Now, if that's the kind of condition that we are experiencing, then we can say that because it's still in equilibrium, we are saying that the upward force is equal to the downward force. So we can say that 15 cos 20 is equals to 20 sine 30 plus the friction force. Let's see what is the value of the friction that we are able to get. So the value of the friction that we're getting, if we solve this in Kelsey, is coming out to be 4.0953 something something newtons. And now let's see if it's going to be equal to the maximum friction or maybe less than that. If this value is less than the maximum friction, we know that this object B is not going to move up the plane. So let's figure out what is the friction that is maximum. We know that mu is equal to 0 0.8 is going to lead to that maximum value of the friction. So R value we still don't know, right? We, we have to figure out what is the value of R. So we can do that by equating these two forces. So R will be equal to this force minus that force. So R is equal to 20 cos 30 minus 15 sine 20. Right? So if you multiply by your 0 0.8 with that value of R, let's see what's the value of the uh, maximum friction that we are able to get. So 0 0.8 times uh, 20 cos 30 minus 15 sine 20. It comes out to be somewhere around 9.752. And obviously this is the maximum value that is pretty much higher than the friction value that we have obtained. So this is still not a limiting equilibrium condition that like, you know, this force is equal to that force, right? We are not getting that. And therefore we can say that it still has a lot of uh, more force that uh, friction can provide. You can still increase the value of this T such that uh, it can reach the condition of that limiting equilibrium. So currently the block B is not moving upwards. That's the conclusion that we are able to draw. Uh, you can write a whole statement that because this friction is less than the maximum friction, the object B is not moving up the plane uh, like this, that 4.0953, 4.0953 is less than the maximum friction. This means block B is not moving up the plane. I hope that this concept is clear to you. What we are trying to see if I have to explain it in a proper way, because I, I know that this kind of question is doubt of a lot of students. So that's why I'll just explain it in a much more proper way again. So this is the condition, the eight newtons that we are trying to provide the friction, the maximum friction is eight newtons. So that condition is not occurring over here. This force is way lesser than that. It's the condition that we were talking about earlier, that five newtons are provided. So it will not move because this maximum is not reached. And that's why it is, it's going to try to block that whole system. It's not going to allow it to move ahead. So that's the kind of uh, thing that we have experienced over here because of which we are seeing that block B is not moving up the plane. I hope that this whole question is clear to everyone. And in case of any kind of doubts, you can reach out to me uh, anytime.